What's up, everybody? On another episode of It's 420 Somewhere, Larry Levy, co-founder and CEO of Lucid Greens, joins us to discuss his company and what he's doing in the cannabis space. Because if it's 420 Somewhere and you're tuned in to Cannabis Legalization News, there's a high likelihood we're talking to somebody in the industry about what they do and how they fit in. And we have that for you today. So let's get into it. Hey, Larry. Thanks for joining us on 420 Somewhere. Thanks, Tom. Well, it was 420, what, three days ago? Timing was good. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. Could you please introduce yourself to the audience and uh, explain what you and Lucid Green are up to in the industry? Yes. Just by way of introduction, what we've tried to do is introduce more and more transparency into the supply chain and the consumer experience within cannabis that really just allows anyone in the supply chain to be able to have access to all of the information associated with the product as it goes through manufacture distribution retail and ultimately consumption so this idea that we we're able to get information from all over all the actors within the supply chain have that information readily available through a QR code scan to anybody that wants to query the product because now thank God for COVID everybody knows how to scan a QR code we're able yeah. to yeah you don't you can't scan a QR code you probably couldn't eat at a restaurant for quite a while <laughs> oh my goodness but we it was interesting because you'd see them before and they just wouldn't get they'd be used in other parts of the world and they weren't getting any traction qr codes until covid and then suddenly they took off yep. mean, like we have one you can buy miggy a coffee <laughs> so if you scan that qr code our co-host sometimes does shows and he's like hey uh, thank you yeah buy me a coffee if you enjoyed this <laughs> yeah that's uh... Yeah, you know what? You got to be thankful for some of the some of the small gifts you get given. Yeah, this idea that through a simple code, anybody in the supply chain can get different information about a particular product is unique and very useful in a highly regulated market, and certainly in a market where, if you look at the consumer. Consumers really don't yet understand what they should be consuming and why. Everybody's endocannabinoid systems are different. But Tom, your reaction to five milligrams of some sativa strain is going to be different to mine. Mm -hmm. and, you know, just through a little bit of knowledge, bit of trial and error, you're going to get to understand what works for you, right? And how do you make sure that, that becomes a consistent enjoy and enjoyable experience? that has you consuming stuff that is safe. And I think that's the big challenge here in this industry today. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why having these types of things can not only help with compliance purposes, but also with consumer trust, as you can scan that after exactly. you bought the package and you know exactly what's in it, what the strain, who the farmer, when it was picked. With the, so there's so many pieces of data. How many pieces of data does that QR code give the consumer? That's, it's a really good question because it depends on like the types of information that we're collecting. If you go from the manufacturer, right? So from a manufacturing perspective, they are putting in things like the name of the product, the SKU, the description, the dosage, the effects, and then the test results, which are called COAs, right? Certificate of, of, of Authenticity. And those COAs can get broken down even further into the ability for you to be able to. Uh oh, all right. We're going to have to do a small reset. Okay, you're anything right. okay. other than a lucid platform which makes us one of the most closely 
I guess if you have a look at all the COAs that get created, mm -hmm. we now have a repository of all the digital COAs that are getting created from all the manufacturers. So now we're able to tell you, hey, Tom, based on your purchase history, because we know every single product you have in the associated COA mm -hmm. down to the terpenes and cannabinoids, we can say, Tom, it looks like the products you buy are high in mercy. You don't even need to know what mercy is, but your purchasing habit indicates that there is a likelihood that you like some compound within the product that you may not even know exists. And by just giving you right. that information, you can now start to look for products that are higher in mercine because they're better for you. Yeah, that's really interesting. You can have your personal strain history and then the company, is it a data analytics company that then can create recommendations for the people that have accounts with them or, or how does that work? Yeah, so the way that we work now and the philosophy of the company is that the data that we are creating and collecting is owned by the brands. So mm -hmm. basically, Papa and Barclay or any of the customers, we have, I think we're over 300 customers that are on our platform now, are able to put information into our system that allows that information to be used by the retailers and the retail menuing systems, et cetera, et cetera, and then ultimately onto their customers. And from a, from a consumer perspective, creating this direct connection between the consumer and the brand is one of the key things that we are trying to achieve, especially based on the fact that it's really difficult for you to market products in cannabis in social media today basically impossible you can try to get some viral shares on instagram but those pictures that you're showing may get deleted and yeah, you're not going to be exactly. able to buy any ads about it whatsoever so it has to be strictly organic which makes it very difficult makes it really difficult so if you can create that direct connection between the consumer and the brand now you have the ability to message that consumer directly, either through our platform or through directly through email or SMS. Off you go. The idea is that we're giving these brands and we're giving the retailers and we're giving the distributors the power to be able to use the data to make their business run more efficiently. I'll give you another great example. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that in states like California, every single product has to have a sticker applied to it at retail that gives the what's called the transfer metric UID, which is the last hop between the distributor and the dispensary. So you mm -hmm. have people, you have tons of staff that do nothing but spend 30% of their day stickering products with these codes. Wow, Highly inefficient. That's, that's something else. Yes. Yeah, so when you walk into these dispensaries, you'll see these little stickers all over the show. And what we've done is by putting all of that information into our Lucid ID, our QR code, mm -hmm. we basically eliminate any of that secondary stickering that needs to happen which is saving tens of thousands of dollars a month per store for these retailers. Interesting. I'm having some technical difficulties on this though, unfortunately. Uh, uh, I'm going to hit a bumper and then uh, do you vaguely recall where we were before I hit that uh, technical difficulties bumper? I think we were, we were talking about the kind of the supply chain and the fact that people retailers do this kind of stickering secondary stickering mm -hmm. process to make sure that they're in compliance with the regulations okay all and right the, let's, let's we've eliminated that great we'll bring it back to there we have the same regulation in illinois but i'll just put that bumper back out and then we come back because there'll be a realization and so i'll clip it depending on where i think it needs to be clipped to fix that uh, okay. And then we just use that uh, bumper as kind of something that allows us to get in or out. And I'll just say, hey, we're back with Larry Levy. And uh, we were talking about 
something that's very important. I have it here in my state. They have it all over the West Coast because I think you're also in Nevada where they have this. It's a yeah, it's the same requirement. I think it's everywhere. Okay, cool. Yep. We'll, we'll come back into it. Hey, everybody. And we are back with Larry Levy. We we're talking about these stickers that are required to be put on to every cannabis product that you purchase in your state. We also have that regulation here. And uh, so you build your QR codes into that stickering process. Is that uh, something that you guys are up to? Yeah. So what we do is everybody has to have the regulatory sticker on the package when it gets produced. And so what we've done is we've added a QR code and incorporated that into the regulatory labeling process, right? Now, what happens is as the information changes, as it moves from the manufacturer to the distributor to the retailer, so information has to be added to the product. And typically, that's another sticker that goes on. What we've been able to do as part of our platform is use that same QR code and just digitally add the information. So now you don't need to add another sticker. You just add that information digitally means there's no stickering required. Interesting. And this saves anywhere from 18 to 37 cents per unit at a retail level. And that adds up when you have oh, real competition. And that's something that you're talking about a lot of competitive advantages and data and understanding your cons customer a lot better for the retail outlets that are out there. Just because you have a dispensary doesn't mean suddenly you're going to, everything's going to go great. So these types of tactics that you can use to reach out to your customer base and set yourself apart from the other dispensaries that I could see ha that having something advantageous. How do you guys do your pricing? So our pricing is at the brand level. So brands pay us two cents for every sticker that has the Lucid ID printed on it. And we then also have a charge for marketing programs. So these marketing campaigns, if they're running loyalty campaigns or if they're running campaigns to do with some kind of awareness or alert campaign, we will charge on a campaign by campaign basis. And the nice thing is that all of this is pay as you go, right? So if you're not producing and if the campaigns are not delivering, you don't pay. If, if you're creating 10,000 products, then, you know, you're going to pay us 20 bucks. If you're creating 2 million products, then you're going to pay us 20 grand. So it just depends on what the, or two grand, it just depends on the volume that you're doing. And this cost associated with the regulatory process and with this efficiency of not stickering and having information that relates to the, both the product itself as it moves through the supply chain. So obviously you get full, you get as a re, as a brand, you get full transparency as to what and where the products are. The other thing that you get is, and this is starting to come back now is the whole product authentic authentication side of things. So each of these codes is unique to every single item. Think of it as a banknote, right? Sorry, we got a lot of birds here in Hawaii. It's all right. <laughs> so you're going to get that background noise. The idea is that you take the you take each unique code and a consumer can now validate through a simple scan of that QR code, whether this is a legit product or not. So no. whether you're cookies or you're any of the vape companies that are highly counterfeited, you now have a really good programmatic way of ensuring that your customers are having the best experience with a legit product rather than a product that's been filled, God knows where they've got these uh, these packaging from China, from any of these different sources that allows you to fill anything with anything, which yeah. makes it more difficult to figure out. And then they have a bad experience and it's, yeah, it's a, 
it's a bad cookies experience or a bad pop and barkley experience or a bad jewel experience whatever the case may be yeah so it also has ip protection implications if you are a cannabis brand famous enough to be ripped off kudos to you how about you protect that? Because then if there is some, t- I don't understand like how you would file a lawsuit to protect your trademark against pirates. They're pirates. <laughs> like, you know, um, but be that as you may, maybe you could, if you were able to figure out how they were doing it. But that well, is, there, you know, there, there actually is a, there is a way to do it, which is we're able to tell the, the border patrol that there are counterfeit products that look like this. So we can actually alert them to the exact products that have been counterfeited Mm -hmm. so that they can be on the, so it's rather than looking out for everything, they can now be very pointed in what they look out for. That's very interesting. Uh, It's a cool product. And then it's so niche. It does that one specific thing. It's not, and then it uses that specific thing to do a marketing thing. It's interesting. This is your guys' website here. Um, the Q, the UPC. What does, you hear that a lot. Yeah, when you're, universal when you're checking product yeah. code is what it's that. The universal product code, a big innovation of 2023. Uh, congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, really, the crux of this whole thing is that code is code. malleable, right? It can be used for so many different things, but it gets applied once at the moment to manufacture. That is the real secret source here. Fascinating. And with the compliance aspect of it, I just wonder sometimes, like in my state, it wouldn't surprise me if, no, the regulation reads you literally must print and stick the sticker on at the register. And I'm not kidding, like it may literally say that, which I think is a little silly considering that this could uh, fix all of those issues and make it a better customer experience on more than just like a particular regulatory level. And it still gives you the compliance though. Yeah. So Tom, you bring up a really good point. And we've been working with, we worked with the New York regulators. We're working with Michigan regulators. Now we've worked with the Nevada regulators and it's funny. It's just, these regulations have been put in place um, with a certain point of view, right? They have a point of view that this is how it should operate and this is what I'm looking for. And yet there sometimes there are these unintended consequences, meaning that people have to do things which just makes no sense. And by educating the regulators that this technology exists, which could eliminate a lot of the manual process that goes into adhering to the regs and yet give them better compliance, they listen and they change the regs or they interpret them differently, which is what we're going through right now in Michigan. It's just an interpretation of a two or three sentences. And one like one regulator's like it means this and the other regulator's like it means exactly. that. Yeah, so now we just basically, we're getting the regulators to tell us what they mean and for that to mean what we, what we hope it means, which is it will allow them to use our platform. So these are, that's why this, it's, yeah, so we do supply chain and then we do marketing side of things. But there is a very heavy lobbying side of this, which allows us to get in front of the regulators and just help them think through a better way to do this. Because at the end of the day, with too much tax being placed on the cannabis operators anyway, why tax them further with having to do certain inefficient processes, which just drives up their costs and reduces their margin. And in today's world, it's all about margin, man. It's, hey, it's not about sales. It's about how do you sell things and make a good margin? Because there's... A lot of people don't, they didn't think they had to focus on that when they got into the industry. I'm like, oh man, you should have. You need to think through year one. That's the limited market states versus the open market states and how quickly that price level drops off. It, it's been big on 
the West Coast and Michigan's getting cheap now too. Oh, um, price compression, it's a real yeah. issue. Yeah. A real issue. And so what that means is everybody just has to operate more efficiently. And that's a big that's a big piece of what it is we're driving is this really efficient operation with full transparency that allows everybody to be able to have this data and do, you know, the right thing with it. Cool. Yeah. It's uh, something that maybe the industry will see more of hopefully because it has the ability to fix a lot of problems and also to you're providing documents and records of these things in a very effective way, which is good because it's interesting how we it, like we talk about this sometimes. I go to the dispensary and they have the stickering requirement there and it'll have the THC levels. They require it and it comes from, you can go and find this at this lab. You usually have a link to that lab and its results. And they're always, or they're very often technically hemp because it's 0.2% Delta 9 THC and like 30% THCA. And so I'm like, oh, that's fascinating. If I got popped with this, like if I was driving through Idaho, I'd be like, no, look, this business record says that this is hemp. Sure, I bought it with my medical license, but when they left, when it was tested by the regulators, it was under the line of the 0.3. Right. So having this other type of QR code there, so you could also show like law enforcement or the customer can have a better experience because they can learn more about the product. It's like the liner notes of the of the packaging. Yeah, it's you actually bring up a really good point about this kind of TA. Everybody focuses on the THC level. Um, it's like, yeah, you know what? We got to walk into a store and we're going to make sure that there's thirty percent THC. Why? It's like the this industry has tried to educate consumers on the need to know more about the terpenes and the cannabinoids than just the THC level. And what we're doing here is we're making it much more visible to the consumer. The consumer literally by scanning that code, the, the COA of that product pops up on your phone. You don't have to go and type anything in. You don't have to search a website. It's right there. And by the way, not only do you get the fact that, you can see the THC and the CBD and the, you know, any of the other major um, cannabinoids, but you can now see the whole terpene profile. Nice. And that's where the magic happens. And this is this industry needs to be really pushing to ensure that there is much more education and awareness on why it's the whole thing that should be looked at, not just an isolated active ingredient within within the cannabis profile yes and one day we hope to get there but uh, the a lot of the people they'll just look at price and thc amounts and they're making a decision like that that's how they're value shopping because with their money they think that they're buying something what are they buying well it's this illicit thing we can't allow to buy and then you can because you can buy terpenes they're everywhere but um, still that aspect of it, I think, will hopefully drown out. I don't go and buy wine going, like, oh, 17% alcohol. This is the wine for me. And I think we'll get there eventually, but the education, and it's still not federally legal. And so I think yeah. it'll be after federal legalization when the education is really caught up and people are just kind of like over it. Like we're 10, 15 years into it. And it's like a generational thing. It's like, yes, we already learned about cannabinoids back in 2022 it, that'll be great but uh, i think until that time people are going to be value shopping by looking at the price and the thc amounts and doing like a little bit of math saying like, i paid this much i got this much bang for my buck so let me give you let me pass this by you you walk into a dispensary and obviously you get carded right you've got to right. take out your license and uh, but when they do that they say Hey, Mr. Howard, uh, thanks for coming back. Based on your purchase history with us, you seem to be over-indexing on, you know, these three terpenes. 
Mm -hmm. Are you interested in learning more? And we have five other products in the store that have the same, if not higher amounts of whatever it is, Mercine, Pinene, whatever that, you know, Tom Howard likes in the store right now. Would you like, would you be interested in trying or purchase? That changes mm -hmm. the way you buy stuff. Yeah, it's the competitive advantage. Now, yeah. because you have that and you're differentiating yourself from the dispensary that didn't invest in this, you now have a deeper relationship with your customer to give them a better experience. And the exactly. purchasing of cannabis experience in what I, I don't believe and I lobby against for a few reasons, uh, the consumer packaged good aspect of cannabis flower. I think it should be done more of a deli style where you bring in your own container and then they weigh it out fresh and then it goes into your eighth jar and you're able to leave with it because it is a higher quality product. You're going to have fresher terpenes in that if it was served like that, just like if it was fresh ground coffee. And then the waste aspect of the industry is large. Every one of these packages, an eighth goes out the door a package goes out the door like that costs that grower two bucks or something like that to make that. And when what now, sometimes it gets got two pieces of garbage. It's got the, the box and then you open up the box and it's the jar. And, and so now we have a jar and a box that we've created waste for. If you had deli style, all of it would have been tracked. It's still in the same inventory control and it's going from point A to point B in a secure location. And then the bud tender, breaks it up, weighs it out, packages it, and gives it to the patient who you've already carded, you've already checked their IDs, they're of legal age to be able to be there, or they're a medical patient, and so they have yep. the right to be there. And then they can leave, and you've not created that waste, and you've given them a better product. So I don't understand why we regulate it. Not, I understand we're going to have to control it. We're going to have to track it. We're going to have to tax it. We're going to have to do the ID. It's going to be a controlled substance, even after it's legal. But how do we do it so that we have the best experience for the person consuming it? That's why I also support it. Yep. So this is that's exactly what we're driving to. Yeah. And it's interesting that you talk about the, the packaging. Think of how much packaging goes to waste when the regulator changes one sentence that now needs to be put onto the packaging. So now they went from this sentence to that sentence and whatever the people, the manufacturer bought that they had in stock, because they have to buy in bulk because that's how you get a better price. Right. And so they're holding this stuff in bulk and they got all this stuff pre-printed and now they got to throw it all out because one paragraph or one sentence changed the uh, the lobby that we're doing is we're saying to the regulators here is a digital packaging right use the qr code as a form of digital packaging because you can change whatever you want to change digitally hell of a lot easier and much more cost effectively than you can if you have to print this stuff on there yeah. so that's how you need to think about this yeah, yeah. And like I've drafted these winning applications for these licenses and you know that they have environmental regulations and packaging regulations and you're supposed to have environmental plans for reducing your impact and waste. But yep. then you also have regulations for packaging and labeling and they seem a little contradictory sometimes. <laughs> and then you're we're at where we're at with legalization it's through having that point and then discussing it and going is this really making sense is this the best that we could be doing maybe we should make these changes in the regulations and they happen over time i know yeah. in michigan you can still get deli style flour it's yeah, nice but uh, i don't think you can do it in california anymore nope yeah. definitely not yeah so Things are going to, you know, we'll see how things settle down and how we'll see how we get to a more mature model that is, that is sustainable because a lot of the stuff that we're doing right now is just not sustainable. Yeah. Very it's, difficult to. That's cost and yep. you're putting it on the grower. And so you have the grower price point going down and then the regulatory compliance cost being pretty high. You how know, do you survive? You yeah, you really have to mind your margins. And so that's one of the reasons it would come off the backs of the grower if they also supported this deli style flower. It would still just be as secure. And then 
the code or that's the other problem then because like each one of those qr codes for that they would then just have to re-sticker there but then you're just throwing away a sticker if you have like a reusable label it's yeah we there's a way to do that we thought about different permutations of delivery and yeah it becomes the the more impactful areas are where you enter the edibles and all the other formats mm -hmm. flower is a relatively unique way of consuming but if you take a look at the other formats that are more problematic in a lot of cases because they are they are how do i put this they look like gummies or they look like chocolates and everybody nobody consumes one square of a 10 square chocolate no if you like the taste you consume more and that's most people itself. they'll eat the whole chocolate bar unless it's like one of those big oversized novelty bars that exactly. has all those squares but uh, yeah. I don't think you need to make the edibles candy. Uh, and so like by making edibles candy like that, you create this issue. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's really, in fact, we had this issue yesterday. We were, we were at somebody and they were like, yeah, the, I think the woman that we were with is in her early sixties and she's struggling to sleep. And we were, they wanted to know what I did, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm in this, the cannabis business. And they're like, oh, they've heard about this stuff for sleep. How do you take it? They don't want to be smoking stuff. Can you get it in a candy or can, yeah. Hey, take a tincture, put under your tongue, wait a mm -hmm. couple of minutes. It'll kick in half an hour, an hour and you're good. Yeah. You can and measure then, it pretty well. The, my, the co-host that I was just on, the feed with over at Cannabis Legalization News live on Sundays. He had this device that I had not seen before, and it's one of these byproducts of our fragmented state by state piecemeal system. And this was out of Rhode Island and it created, it was almost like a, an inhaler. And so, like a titrated specific dose of in, something that was inhaled. So, distilled out and created so that it's it's not smoking and so it would be a, an easier method of consuming but with the fast acting of the inhalation and i'm like that's neat i've never seen anything like that because and now it's gotten into massachusetts because it's rose and rhode island and so it's just it takes time for technologies to even proliferate because how you do one thing in one state okay great how do you get into the next state? Because you probably aren't going to be able to get that license because you're not from there. And then all the other complex complications, will the regulations allow you to even have that methodology of delivery right. at that state? It's uh, the complexities that arise because of the lack of federal legalization make the industry very difficult. Yeah, that is... <laughs> You touch on another point, which is I'm out here in Hawaii. What, what a great place to grow weed. And yet there's not a, you know, this is not a huge industry, a huge market here for firstly, it's not rec legal, it's medical only. And then you have a look at the fact that we're not going to be able to cross state lines for a while. Who right. knows? And then you look at the way that you consume other things like wine. Like how often have you drank wine from Massachusetts or New York or Michigan or you don't Yeah. you get your wine from France or you get your wine from California or that's right. Know. That's right. I would get my wine from France or California or Argentina or Chile right. or every now and then you mix in a new country that you didn't know made wine. Sometimes you're, yeah, wouldn't do that country again. So the point being that stuff grows really well in certain geographies. And 
doesn't grow as well in others. And what happened with this patchwork of legalization that we have is you're being forced to consume products that have been literally artificially created in certain geographies that are never going to give you the same experience. And uh, that will shake itself out, but then that will probably, it, you have this anti-legalization aspect of the legalized industry, because then if you have a license in a state, that would be like making Illinois wine. Nobody ever has heard of Illinois wine. <laughs> exactly. It's not very good. Sorry, all the Illinois vinters that are out there that I guess it is. Yes, it is. But uh, <laughs> they don't know. They don't watch the show. However, um, they would have an interest in saying, OK, we don't want this good California weed or Oregon weed or Washington state weed where they have those climates coming and outstripping our stuff because we've sank a lot of money in these facilities. Yeah, that's why this is complex, man. This is not going to be easy. This is. And yet, if you have a look at it from a consumer perspective, you know what the right thing to do is, right? Yeah. But from the industry perspective and the players that have invested all of that money in getting those licenses, those they've got to protect their interest. You understand this, and this is why cannabis is such an interesting industry to be operating in. I got into it in, yeah, when did I start this thing? 2008. Oh, wow. Like That's OG uh, stuff. But you're in the West Coast. So were you were in California when you got started? We started. At, so I'm actually I'm based in New York. So the company's based in New York. We actually our first focused market was California. And the reason we chose California was because it was the single biggest market with the most competition. Right. And they understood the whole supply chain and they understood branding and they understood how to differentiate themselves. So not like a vertical state where, you know, whatever you grow, you sell. And therefore, there's not much of a need for actual marketing. So we started in on the West Coast in, in California. And in, in 2008, it was interesting because we, we set the system up so that we could literally trace everything back from the seed, the soil it was grown in, and all the subsequent tests that would get done. Mm -hmm. And we very quickly were told that's not a level of transparency we are comfortable exposing. Wow. So we then went and said, OK, We'll deal with the final COA because that's all the state is interested in. And we'll focus on that. But yeah, it's interesting to see how this industry has started to move away from that analog world. And the analog world in 2018, 2019, when I'd go and visit a brand, it would be, yeah, turn left at the red pillbox roll down your window and if you smell weed you're in the right place no address <laughs> no social nothing this was all very analog yeah you just aren't going to be able to make it if you are operating like that anymore unless the way that you're making it is that um, there's a lot of slippage or illicit selling into the gray market Same. yeah, yeah. Well, people are going to do stuff to survive right you can't it's hard to blame them when right. the uh, they're being crushed by, as you say, these opposing forces of lower prices and higher rate mm -hmm. and higher taxation. Like, where do you go? So it's, yeah, there's never a dull moment in this industry. That's for sure. There's a curveball every day of the week. It sure is. And then once you figure out, like, you got it, no, you don't. <laughs> Something else will happen. Just give it oh, a bit. Yeah. Um, that's, that's awesome. True. Hey, uh, is there anything else we should touch on that you're doing in the industry? It says that sometimes you're you guest lecturer at entre, in entrepreneurship at the Cornell University Johnson School of Management. Yeah, I've uh, actually I I've stopped doing that for a while, and 
it's my, my I've been an entrepreneur all my life. I, uh, I keep telling people I'm unemployable. I've never really yeah. had a boss. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I tell yeah. people my boss is a real jerk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. I yeah. know the feeling. Yeah. I, I, I wake up and I go to sleep with that same boss. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. And how, what was your first entrepreneurial venture? How long ago was that? My first entrepreneurial venture was a long time ago. And it's uh, nothing I'm that proud of. I used to, uh, I used to work in a windsurfing shop and uh, I got wind of the fact that, and this was back in South Africa where I grew up and I got wind of the fact that the there was a manufacturer of fake Lacoste shirts that operated a factory right next to where these windsurfing boards were made, right? Mm -hmm. Where these and this was in Taiwan. I cut a deal with them to say pack the shirts in the windsurfing boxes. These windsurfing boxes are 10 14 feet long and so it needs all the packaging so they'd pack them in there and i was still in university at the time and basically created a business selling what i called summer weight lacoste shirts i needed to make sure that the crocodiles didn't swim off so i had a whole team of seamstress that would make sure that those were sewn on correctly. I would change the buttons. So it had the ivory button backs. So I did a whole lot of it. So got to a point where this was so successful mm -hmm. that the real import Lacoste, Lacoste shirts uh -huh. then issued me with a cease and desist letter. At which point in time I said, I've arrived, I've come and I've gone. That's it. I'm out of here. Gave me enough money to travel and buy a few things, and that was it. So that was my first foray into understanding a market and its dynamics. And you saw an opportunity, and you took it. Yep. All right. That is freaking cool. So from South Africa originally, thank you for coming on the program and telling us about Lucid Green. I really enjoyed speaking with you. What else is on the horizon for you guys in 2023? Any other markets? Yeah, we're, uh, we're starting to get into a couple of other markets that it's what's what I find interesting now is that there are markets that we're going to go into where they've already identified these problems. And it's a hell of a lot easier to get 60, 70% of that market out of the gate. Yep. So that's the goal right now. So we're identifying those markets. So you'll probably see us in another five or six markets this year. And really the goal is for us to have this code be a standard in the industry that allows anybody to be able to operate their business more effectively. Um, awesome. Yeah. And, and there's a ton of stuff under the covers, including not having to have a QR code, but to use other types of signaling devices. So you're familiar with NFC, touchless payments and all that stuff. So we're going to start looking at how we introduce the need to not have to scan something, but just touch the box or get in close proximity to actually do the same thing as you do by scanning a QR code. And this is going to help a lot of the... Um, industry side of inventory management uh, and yeah all the way down to having much more much better packaging experience and authentication so there's a ton of stuff that's in the works that will probably be releasing in a year 18 months and then we're all looking at federal legalization and going what does that look like for us well, that's um, some that's some lobbying to start with, because if they required that, that'd be pretty sweet for your company. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Hey, that's our program on 420 Somewhere. If you guys want to come on and talk about what you're doing in the industry, get in touch with us. And uh, thank you so much for coming on, Larry. I had a great time speaking with you. And because it's 420 Somewhere, we like to end the show with this bumper.